Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. But I wonder if we were to ask ourselves the question, but what does Jesus mean to you? I think if I were to ask the question, we'd probably have would have a multitude of responses and, and different answers and and some may be meaningful and others may be just like, well, you know, it's my first day in church today, so I don't really know. And that's cool. I, I don't I don't hate on anyone, but I think that this is a perfect opportunity for us to ask ourselves, I wonder if because you may have a meaning for Christ, but but I wonder if that name has any influence in your personal life. I wonder if that name has any influence in the culture of your family. And in these next few weeks, we're, we're, we're starting this new series called It's Jesus. And today I'm going to lay a foundation. But I want us to really um, get a deeper revelation and understanding of the name of Jesus. It's not, Jesus is not just a holiday that we celebrate. Jesus is not a baby in a manger, obviously, anymore. He's the risen king, right? Uh, Jesus is not the necklace with a cross uh, over your neck. Jesus is more than just a bumper stipple, uh, uh, sticker, a label, or even uh, a hashtag. Uh, Jesus is so much greater than, than all of the things that we have as a world or as a society or even as a Christian culture that we've made of it. And I, I really hope and pray that, that we would understand the significance of the name of Jesus. He is more than a savior. How many believe that? He's way more than just, he's my savior, he's my Lord, he's my salvation. Yes, that's awesome. But how many know that if you read your Bible, there is a greater description of the name of Jesus. And so the goal in the next three weeks is to get us to understand um, the, the description that God gives us in his word about who Jesus should be to us in this culture in this generation, and that we still have the power to have influence in changing the world. Amen? That's what, that's what we want. I hope that's what everybody wants. Because if not, then we'll just keep living a religious life. And, and really, listen, Jesus is more than a church service. He's more than a song. He's more than all those things. And we have to get that in our spirit. we got to get that, that understanding just to go a little bit deeper. Now, I believe that the number one um, rule of walking with God is connecting our life with the name of Jesus. We have to connect our life with that name because in society, everybody is following someone or everyone is following something or most people are. And we have to understand as believers, we are following Christ. We are following Jesus. And we have to understand who we follow, and we also have to understand that my identity, okay, I reference my identity based on the one in whom I'm following, and I really believe that as we spend these next few weeks, we're going to understand the importance of this. Also, I want you to know that this, this name that, that we're going to be talking about is significant, just like you want your name to be significant. I think most of us here want to guard our name. We want to guard our reputation because every single person's name here means something. As a matter of fact, people will literally label you or describe you or make an assumption or a judgment just based on your name. Like I can say, you know, Uncle, Uncle Pedro. And you know what? In my family, <laughs> we know some stuff about Uncle Pedro, you know, and it ain't all that. You know, it, you, can, you can throw out some names of maybe some people that you know. And you're, you're like literally going to immediately give a description of that person, whether it's good or whether it's bad. But I really believe that everyone in this room wants to guard and protect the significance of their name. And, and that's, that's something that we should. For example, uh, when people describe us, we want people to describe us as, um, hey, man, they treat people well or how you talk to people or how you serve people or how you work or how you hardly work, um, how you take care of your body or how you don't take care of your body, how you treat your family, how you mistreat people. And so we want 
people to be able to say our name and say, wow, you know what, that person, man, they're, they're hard workers. I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't want anyone to ever say, man, Pastor Mauricio was just lazy. Man, he just opened the church and just, you know what, by the, you know, the seat of his pants, he's just trying to figure it all out and just hoping that it was all going to work out and, and there's no impact, there's no effectiveness. And uh, I, 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 would not, I would never want Elevate Church to be labeled as a church that just, they're just, they're just having church. They just show up on Sunday, sing songs. People hear a sermon, but they don't change their world. That, that is not the label. That's not the image that we want to give our city, our community, or even our world. We want the world to know that there's a church in the city of New Hall, California, that is making an impact, not only it's in, in its own community, but literally globally. And that's who Elevate Church is. Amen? Amen. That's who we are. Yes. So Jesus also cared about his name. Let me show you this. Philippians 2, verse 6 through 7 says this. In his very nature, he was what? God. Okay, so check this out. Jesus was equal with God. But Jesus didn't take advantage of that fact. And isn't it interesting how Christians, we can be the most entitled people. We can be the kind of people like, we deserve everything. Like, what is God doing for me? Or what's that church doing for me? Or what's pastor going to be doing for me? We can, this is, honestly, I believe this is the me generation. But Jesus, he made sure that his name would not have this. Now, now we know, do you think Jesus lacked identity in knowing that he was all powerful, all magnificent, all wonderful, all knowing? Do you think that he lacked that identity? He didn't lack, he, as a matter of fact, I think that the most confident people are the most humble people. The most powerful people are the most humble people. And Jesus gives a description of how he was going to live out the name that was given to him. Jesus didn't pick his name. Joseph and Mary didn't pick the name of Jesus. It was never man's idea. As a matter of fact, the angel of the Lord came and spoke to Mary. And you know that conversation. And he said, the angel said to Mary, and you will call his name Jesus Christ, the anointed one. And so names have meanings, don't they? Since biblical times, they have so many meanings. Your name right now means something to someone that you know, someone at work. Maybe your boss has a name for you. May not tell you up in your face, but, but they got a name for you. And it's either hard worker or hardly working, you know, or it's kind or it's rude, you know, or you're someone that's known for your, your, your love or you're unlovely, or you're beautiful, or you're ugly, meaning beautiful in spirit and how you carry yourself, etc. But look what he said. He said, but Jesus didn't take advantage of the fact that he was equal to God. Verse 7, instead, he made himself nada. He made himself nothing of no reputation other than the ones he served. He said this. He did this by taking on the nature of a servant. He was made just like human beings. In other words, it is possible for you and I to not take advantage of the fact that we have all power because of the Son of Christ who lives in us, who has amazing identity. I mean, our bloodline, our pedigree is royalty, but we don't take advantage and act arrogant about our Christian walk with God, even in arguing with people in the world that may not have the same faith or belief in Christ like you do, but because you, you choose to just be like Christ said, instead, he made himself nothing. I am nothing but a servant. Just imagine how much the world would want to know our Christ when we learn how to be the greatest servants, regardless if they agree with you or not. Like, I serve you based on who I am in Christ, not based on what you do for me. I give not based on what they do for me. I give because I'm a generous person in God. There's a whole nother mindset. There's a whole nother revelation when you understand this is, this is Jesus saying, hey, listen, this is how I carried my name. This is how I walked in power. I made nothing of myself servanthood it's funny because church today i'm telling you globally christians are always in it for what's in it for me or when something doesn't happen the way christians want it to we start making our decisions based on 
what we're receiving or not. We, we forget who we serve. We serve Christ. We serve Jesus. We make of no reputation. His reputation was servant. And so Jesus guarded his name. He protected his name from the assumptions and the judgments of people for the sake of making sure that he honored God. Like my name, my name, listen, it takes a lifetime to build reputation. It takes one day to ruin it. Just one day. And so Jesus is like, man, we got to make sure that we guard this. And how many know that names can give you access that others don't have, huh? It's amazing. I remember when we were uh, acquiring the two buildings we have across the street, the kids' buildings, and, and, uh, and we went to the city. And for six months, I mean, God bless our city. We love them. But, man, to get the church to, to take more property to take more land it's always going to be a pushback and i understand it it's beyond the city i know the enemy doesn't want the kingdom of god to expand it doesn't want it to reach more people and for six months it was like no no now this now that and it was like a headache six months every day i was dealing with the city and guess what so i have a friend and i called him i said man i'm so exhausted i'm tired i've i've had you know you know, prayers. I, I've done it all. And, and he said, well, you know what? Let me call someone. And I said, okay. And he called someone, and uh, that someone uh, happened to be someone very powerful uh, that worked with the city whenever the city was in trouble. And that guy said to the city, hey, uh, you have a problem with Elevate Church? Elevate Church is my friend. I get a call. The next day, the city says, hey, your paperwork is ready. Come sign. It's all in who you know, I'm telling you, man. There are certain names that have access to things that you have no access to. But when you have the name of Jesus, you have all access to all kinds of things. But you got to know that name. It's all in who you know. And does that name have any meaning? Huh? Yeah, it's funny. Even here at church, sometimes we have bad sheep. Bad yeah, I'll tell our leaders, here's what I want us to do. And the, the sheep, bad, they kick against the goats. Why do we have to do that? And it sucks because then our leaders had to say, well, Pastor Maurice is the one who told us, bad, okay, bad. <laughs> some names have access and some names don't. Just like you have access to your bank account and no one else in this room does. You have the power of attorney. Only you can make that decision. Let's keep reading. Is that okay? The disciples um, at this point of John the Baptist were hanging out with him. And go with me to John chapter 3, verse 28. They're hanging out. They're doing water baptisms. We know the story, right? John the Baptist, uh, he's, he's baptizing people for the remission of their sins because, you know, Jesus hadn't stepped into his full calling yet. But now the disciples that were with John, his crew, were looking the fact that Jesus was like, like reaching all kinds of multitudes of people. And the disciples, they ran back to John the Baptist complaining. They're like, hey, dude, John, man, there's this guy, this guy named Jesus. Man, he's taking our, he's taking our congregation. He's taking our people. And he's, he's got more influence than you. What's going on? And John's like, man, calm down. Relax. Look what he says. John 320, 320 says, you yourselves bear me witness. In other words, you've heard me say this. That I said, I'm not the Christ. That's not my name. I'm not Christ, the anointed one. He is the anointed one. The guy that you see that's coming this direction, that's the one that I've been trying to tell you all about. He says, we are here. I'm not Christ, the, uh, I'm not Christ, the Christ. He says, but I have been sent before him. In other words, what John, what John was saying was, I'm just the opening act to this concert, but he's the main event. And so many of us, we're living our life like we're the main event when you're just the opening act. And you think you're all that in a bag of chips and a bag of tortillas, right? You're just like, man, I'm all, it's all about me. It's all about me. No. See, John understood the, the revelation of the name of Jesus. As a matter of fact, look at verse 30. Look what he says, 330. He says, he must increase, but I must. I know you're 
a wonderful Catholic church. Let's try this again. He must decrease. Very well. Good, good job. Give yourselves a big hand. That was awesome. That was so great. Listen, the only way, and I'm going to say this gently, but I'm going to be honest with you. The only way you'll ever come to the full knowledge of the name of God is until you learn how to decrease so that he must increase. If there's too much of you, kind of like remember when, when, when Mary was trying to give birth to Jesus, she went to all the different rooms and they all said there's no room for you. There was no room for him. Well, I wonder how many of us also, you may not be an in, but in this, there's no room for you. Because there's too much increase in here and not enough decrease. And so John understood that, hey, listen, we have to realize the fact that this guy right here, this man, this Lord, this King, this Savior, he has to increase now. And we all have to decrease and begin to follow the one that has been promised to us, the Messiah the King, the Savior, the Lord of our life. And we have to learn how to understand that truth. And when you understand that truth, when you have the reverence and the respect and the fear of that name. I mean, you heard the video. Some said, you know what, they just, people use his name and they use it as a curse. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But that name will never have increased in your life until you decrease. Why? Because when you allow that name to increase in your life, when you allow Jesus to increase you in your life, there's power. Power to what? Power to heal you. Power to deliver you. Power to save you. I'm going to say this, okay? There is no such thing as all roads lead to God. There, that is a lie. Jesus is not confused. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Anything outside of that is a gospel of convenience that man has created. God's not confused about what he said about his son. And so we have to get that revelation. If not, we'll start trying to adopt the, the spirit of this world, the mindset of this world, the ideas of this world. And then this becomes our new gospel just for the fact that we just want to be relevant, unacceptable. We have the word of God, and the word is relevant for every generation, past, present, and future. He has the power to stop demons, and I know that a lot of Christians don't like to talk about demons, but they'll go watch demonic movies. Hey, hey, so, lights out. <laughs> uh, go to church, you hear demons, the devil. Oh, whoa, chill. It, it's hilarious. But how many know that the world is hungry for the supernatural? You know what? The supernatural that we should be walking in is in the power of Christ, in the power of his name. This world is hungry for the supernatural. Oh, you think, you think Hollywood has, has a, a script or a storyline of horror movies? Read your Bible, man. Man, it'll make your hairs go up. I'm going to read some stories right now. I'm telling you, this world has nothing on this name. He has the power to... To cast out demons, to stop demons. Look at this. Philippians chapter 2 verse 9. We're going to see how much God invested power in this name. It says, therefore God also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above some names. A few names. He gave him the power and gave him the name above every name. Above cancer. Well, I don't know. I know a lot of people that died. Well, I know a lot of people that haven't died of cancer. He has, he has the name above anxiety. He has the name above depression. He has the name above leukemia. He has the name above, above multiple sclerosis. He has the name above every name. He has the name above poverty and lack. Well, then why, why, is, why, is, why are all these things so rampant in the church? Because we don't know the fear of that name. Have you ever asked yourself, why is it then that there is a, this ineffectiveness or ineffectiveness in our own personal life of the manifestation of that name? I'll tell you why. Because we have more faith in depression than we do in Christ. We have more faith in our dysfunction than we do in that name. 
We have more fear of cancer than we have the fear of the Lord. So how are we going to get the power back in our homes? How are we going to get the power back in our church? How are we going to get the power back in our life? Until we understand that the name is much more than just Savior. He's much more than a baby in a manger. He's much more than a song, which worship was awesome today, right? But he's more than that. You don't have to leave here and be like, man, wouldn't that, they played my jam. That was awesome. You know, like, that's, that's my jam. Okay, well, guess what? Jesus is greater than your jam. And so he says, verse 10, that at the name of Jesus, everybody say, at the name of Jesus. Look, every knee should bow. Of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, he said, every knee, not some knees, not, not one knee. He said, every knee. Amen? Every single knee. Listen, government is not above the name of Jesus. Presidents is not above the name of Jesus. Jesus is above every name in heaven and on earth. And until we understand that, we're gonna, we will, we'll never stop the divisiveness that we see not only in our political world, but there's so much politics in the church. And the reason we don't see power is because we're too busy thinking about that everything else has a greater name than the one name that we have who is greater than all of it. Jesus. You know what? As a matter of fact, you know who your government is? Respect the authorities. Okay? Do, do what you're supposed to do. Vote. But don't forget, you're a foreigner in this world. You're, you're not even from this world. You're going back to where you're originally from. You and I, we are kingdom. We, we belong in the kingdom. We're from the kingdom of God. You're, if you don't believe that, then you don't understand the gospel. You're just passing by. So stop getting so comfortable and trying to gain it all. Because guess what? When you die, you take nothing with you. It all, the only thing you can take with you is souls. I wonder how many souls you're bringing with you to heaven. And so he says, and every knee will bow of those in heaven and on earth and those under the earth. The name above every possible name. His name is Jesus. All right, let's go to another verse. Look at this. Exodus 20, verse 7 says this. You shall not take the, 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 the Lord your God in vain, the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. All right, let's talk about that. Because sometimes, you know what, we think that, that people using his name in vain are those that use his name in, in like curse words or whatever. And we just get stuck there. Like, oh, I never take God's name in vain. Oh, really? Let's talk. Let's talk. Okay, so let me just open our eyes here today a little bit. Because we have to check ourselves before we wreck ourselves. Right? We got to check ourselves from the neck up. We have to check ourselves and examine ourselves. Like, like the Bible says, check yourself whether or not you're still in the faith. So let's just check ourselves. So you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. I've never done that, Pastor. I'm good. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. All right. I look up the word vain, and here is the definition of vain. Useless, pointless, hopeless, ineffective, fruitless, impotent, unproductive, and abortive. Have you ever had an attitude of any that, have you ever looked at your situation and said, hopeless? You took the Lord's name in vain. Have you ever aborted a vision, a dream that God specifically gave to you, but life got so heavy, life got so real, life got so authentic for all my millennials that you started thinking, well, you know what, this is, this is never going to happen. Let's just abort this. Have you ever felt a sense of like, you know what, um, this is so unproductive. Because it's not happening as fast as you want it to happen. See, when you do that, you are taking the Lord's name in vain. And that's an ouchie. But the word vain is simply that definition there. Have you ever looked at your situation and been like, man, this is hopelessness. 
that's in vain. You don't respect the name of Jesus. Listen, I'm not saying deny your hopelessness, but I am saying, but come back to Jesus. Because we're all going to have uh, moments in our life where we will feel pointless, useless, hopeless, unproductive. You will feel like, I want to abort this. But at the end of all this, what drives you? Is it that name, that, that, that name that I put all my faith in, that in the name of Jesus, I don't know when, I don't know how, I don't know where, I don't know what, but all I know is that I have this name that's above every name, and we will see the victory of God in this situation. That's where we got to get to. I was shocked when I saw that definition because I'm thinking, man, I think we're all guilty of being people that have taken his name in vain. I mean, I've been in hospitals where people have been already at the point of brain dead, and I've had to correct families because they're like, oh, no, they're dead already. They're dead. I'm like, whoa, slow down. Hold on. Are, okay, so they're brain, but are they, like, what are some signs? And I started, I'm like, well, it sounds like that person still has some, some possibility because unless that person is dead, then there's still hope. Yes or no? I mean, come on. You, God gave you and I the power of attorney to use his name. Why is the church not using his name? Why? Why is it that we only use the name to sing beautiful songs that say, Jesus, Jesus, right? You make the darkness tremble. Right? We sing all that. And then we're in darkness, and amen. The only one that's trembling is you. I mean, that's the only thing that trembles is us. Listen, the Bible says that even demons tremble at the name of Jesus. Man, when you walk into hospital rooms, demons should say, oh, shoot, here they come again. Let's get out. Let's go. Why? Because you walked in. Because who? Because you have Christ accompanying with you. He is walking in with you into the hospital room. You think, you think you're the healer? That's a joke. You think you're the deliverer? That's hilarious. You think you're the one that's going to redeem and say, no, you don't. You're just the vessel that the spirit of the living God lives in. And then you walk in a room and all power. Come on. God will give you the attorney of power because of the name of Jesus to turn things around. Well, amen, but when will we do it? Amen. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. <laughs> don't give me, I'll read the verse like that. I tell you, I, sometimes I feel like the Mexican T.D. Jakes. Don't give me, don't get it twisted, man. Uh, someone give me a hanky. We'll get it going. God wants us to use that name with meaning and purpose. Not religion. Religion. Religion is you come to church, you hear a message, you sing, sing some songs, and you go back to your normality. That's religion. The relationship keeps it fresh, exciting. You can't wait to do something. And kind of like when you met that person you really cared about man you really dressed yourself up then you got him then you let yourself go <laughs> like you wake up the next morning what happened to you man <laughs> i got you <laughs> that's how we treat jesus sometimes we got excited at first we had butterflies we're like yes <laughs> jesus crying in services then you got comfortable and now he's like I go to church. He's more than church. He got, God put so much power in that name for us to misuse it. I'll never forget. I remember preaching at a conference, and there was this big name dude there that I was speaking at as well. And the guy, he, he just kept torturing my name. You know, my name's a difficult one, Mauricio. 
It's a different. I get it, man. I get, but but I've been developed already. I've been trained at Starbucks to be tortured with that name forever, so I've got well trained. So I got used to it. Like you know, of course. So I don't hate on people that torture my name. I really don't. It doesn't bother me because that's why I just every time I go to Starbucks or any place for coffee, I always say my name's Isaac, Bill, <laughs> Barbara, Michelle. I, I'll just make up names as I go. And um, but this one guy, but I don't like it when someone has the audacity. Like this dude, he's like, you know what, man? I'm sorry, I can't pronounce your name. I'm just going to call you Maurice or Morris or some weird name, some weird thing. And, and he's like, we will call you Mars. I'm like, I'm like, no, no. My name is Mauricio. You will not call me Morris now. You can keep torturing my name, but you will not call me Morris or whatever, Maurice, whatever the heck he was calling me. But that, that's a misuse of my name. That's like you going to God and saying, you know, God, our generation, <laughs> you know, we're trying to be relevant. So I'm not going to say Jesus. I'll just call him Big J. <laughs> you laugh, but that's the culture we live in. Man, we got people that will pray in restaurants. I honestly believe it's not because you're trying to be, oh, holy thou art. I think it's because of fear. I got people that I'm always hearing say, in thy name we pray. Listen, his name is Jesus. In the name of Jesus, amen. Glory to God. So in his holiest of names, we, he, he's got a name. That's like me saying, um, hey, you, why don't you go uh, do that? That's disrespectful. That's a misuse of Lori's name. Lori is Lori. You know, I don't want someone telling. I mean, how would you like someone to say, hey, that guy, the black hat guy, go. You, um gray sweatshirt go you go with it no i have a name and that name means something to me well guess what god has a name and his name has meaning to him and it has purpose and it has life and it has power and we have to stop misusing that name in vain look at your neighbor and say you better stop it and I, listen, I want you to look and say, I think he's talking to me. <laughs> Mars. <laughs> don't, don't ever. Okay, Acts 19, quickly. Look, we got to get out of here. Is it warm in here or is it me? Yeah. It's warm? How many are saying it's warm in here? With the, how, many it's, how many are saying it's cold? Who doesn't care? <laughs> yeah, let's just keep going. Now look, Acts 19, quickly, we're almost done. Now God worked, everybody say, unusual. unusual. Miracles by the hands of who? Paul, a human person. How about that? So that even the handkerchiefs or the aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Wow. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists Come on, there's a scary movie right there. Took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. But watch this. Saying, we exercise you by the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also, there were seven sons there of Sceva, of Jewish chief priests who also did so. But look at this. Verse 15. And the evil spirit. Come on, man. Look at that. And the evil spirit answered and said, uh, Jesus, I know, right? That, just think about the most demonic sound, okay, for you horror flick people. <laughs> Jesus, I know, and Paul, I know, but who are you? See, I wonder how many of us have demons that aren't even afraid of you. Like, you walking in the hospital is a joke to them. Like, <laughs> it's not like they believe. Or, or you going to work and, not, and not, not reminding yourself or forgetting the fact that God said, I gave you power to be witnesses, but you are powerless in witnessing to anybody. Like, people at your workplace don't even know that you're a Christian. And when they find out, they say, I'm a Christian too. And then you got secret service Christians in the workplace. <laughs> That's what happens in work nowadays. Like, oh, my God, you're a Christian. Shh. Let's keep that down. 
too many undercover Christians. And they'll use the, the excuse of, I don't want to lose my job. I get it. The job and the workplace doesn't pay you to preach Jesus. Do that on your lunch hour. Your job doesn't pay you to read the Bible on your work hour. When you are an excellent, hardworking Christian that is a powerful witness for Jesus, even the workplace, the hater, the evil people will find favor on you just because of your diligence. It's not because, listen, the world doesn't have an issue with Jesus. The world has an issue with Christians. It's not Jesus they got a problem with. It's the ones who represent him. It's the ones who, who are trying to uphold his reputation. And you can't. And here's the reality. Aren't you glad that God doesn't need you to hold up his reputation? God didn't even, even need you, you to protect him. I'm going to protect, praise God, the God. No, I think the gospel's doing just fine. For 2,000 years, it's been just fine. The only reputation that we have to fix our eyes on is our own. So let's go back to the, the horror flick. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus, I know, Paul, I know, but who are you? Then the man whom the evil spirit was, uh, 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 whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overpowered them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house. Look at that, butt naked. What movie have you seen that happen in? <laughs> I mean, yeah, there's nasty flicks where they're already naked, but I'm talking about like just... Clothes is falling off as they're running. And wounded. Verse 17, this became known both to all the Jews and the Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on some of them. No, fear fell on all of them. They started saying, wow, something about that name. There's something about that name. And the name of the Lord Jesus was what? Magnified. Wow. Jeez. Do you still have the awe of God in your life? Come on. When you sing, is it just Jesus? Jesus? Are you just going for the rhythm? Are you just going for the beat? Or is there meaning and purpose to that name? Jesus. <laughs> we will see God's power again when we believe in God's power. We will see God's unusual miracles again when we believe in them. We will see breakthrough in families. We will see healing in bodies. We will see redemption. We will see restoration. Heck, we'll see a whole city. We'll see a world come to the knowledge of Christ Jesus when we believe again. skip some verses look at Mark 16 17 quickly and here are the miraculous signs that those who believe will do who will do say I will do now if you don't like it don't do nothing when you get to heaven then you answer to God that's between you and God I'm not here to you know get upset at anybody but if you get to heaven and you did nothing in your resume of being a follower of Jesus Christ. Number one, winning souls. Number two, changing lives. Right? Number three, leading your family to heaven. It's in whatever order you want, I don't care. But it would suck if you get to heaven like, man, and you're like that, that one guy that was given a talent and he was more afraid of the name and preaching that name and so he buried the name and then he told God, look, here, I give you back what you gave me. God's going to be like, you wicked and lazy servant. How dare you? But I was afraid. I was afraid because you're harsh. Let me tell you something. No, God is not harsh. Harsh is what we fail to do for the one who shows us grace and mercy and forgiveness. That's harsh. You've been given a name with power. A name with purpose, a name, with meaning. Right now, we, 
we travel to Mexico because we have the school in Mexico for kids. But let me tell you something. Everybody just sees the, the highlight. Oh, that's so sweet. Yay. No one sees the danger behind it. We are literally interrupting the transaction of children being labor trafficked and sex trafficked. Do you realize how dangerous that is? On this last trip, we had our camera and film crew with us. And one of the underground organizations of crime approached our camera guy and was trying to get all crazy on him. And um, it's dangerous. And of course, um, I come from a background of the streets, delivered sometimes. <laughs> and so I told that guy, I'm like, no, bro, not today. No, no, get, get out of here. That was my, that was my, my not so bright side. But deep down inside, I know why I'm there. And I know who I'm there for. And I'm there for the name of Jesus, for the purpose of Jesus, for the mission of Jesus. And so when people ask me, including the, the founders of Zoe International, who were the directors of, for Latin America in, in, in combating child human trafficking, when they ask us, aren't you guys afraid? Are you okay? Or, let me tell you something. I'm not. There's something about that name when you know the name and when you have your identity in him and when you know that I'm here for Jesus, how could, how could anything go wrong? How? People say, well, you're stupid because things can go wrong. Well, guess what? I'm not stupid or oblivious or denying that something can go wrong. But that's the difference between the name you know and the name I know. That's the difference. And you know what? You can argue all you want theology, but you can't argue my story. Because in this story, I've gone through cancer. Both my children have almost died on me. Being born, as a matter of fact, this year, Alexis right there on the piano. In February, we're in vacation in Mexico. And we were deep in the mountains. We wanted to have a day. We work a lot. We work a lot. And so we get one vacation out of the year, and we take advantage of that one vacation. So we went quadding. And we were deep in the mountains. And in Mexico, in this part where we were at, there is no trauma center. There is no hospital. There are clinics. Yeah, I didn't think about any of that. We are too busy on the quads. It's going to be awesome. So we're riding the quads, right? My son is, is in front of Alexis. Then we had Alexis and me because, you know, the boys want to take care of our little girl. And, uh, and then we had the guide in the front. And we're going, and we're going up the mountains and everything. Well, Alexis ends up hitting the side of a mountain. And the whole, all I see before my, my eyes is this quad just goes straight up in the air. And her body's going back. And somehow I was able to literally, like, fly off of my, my quad. I literally just, while it was still on drive mode. I have all this on GoPro. I flew off the, I just jumped, first reaction. And before the, the, the uh, uh, quad was going to crush her, I, I pulled her body out quickly and, and then the thing came crashing down. But she went head first, there was rocks and everything. As a pastor, I've seen multiple, multiple people breathe their last breath. I've been with people at their very last minute, their very last breath. And I know what death looks like because I've been around it long enough to see it. And when I looked into my daughter's eyes, her eyes were wide open. It wasn't, it wasn't like this. It was just wide, eyes wide open and no more breathing. We're in the deep and the depths of the mountains. And no one can help me. The guide was even like, hey, uh, you know, kind of like, is everything okay? Dude, we just had a huge, just no urgency whatsoever. And I felt at that moment, in the flesh as a father this this sense of like hopelessness because i'm like other than pulling god, god and getting her out before it crushed her that was one thing but there's nothing else i can do nothing or we think and all i remember saying jesus jesus give her back to me jesus and i just started shouting the name of jesus and i'm not kidding you all i remember not to go back and see the video again, was Alexis going like this, <gasps> as if life was given back to her. Now, 
You can argue doctrine all you want, but no one will ever argue my story with my Lord and Savior, Jesus. He saves. He delivers. He heals. He restores. He redeems. He protects. That's my Jesus. What Jesus do you serve? What influence does he have in your life? Is it just religion to you? Peter was going to pray at the hour of prayer at the temple. And I remember, I think it was Peter and James. And they're going to the church to pray. And they see a man who had been lame and weak, couldn't walk for years and years. And they didn't care about figuring out or even asking them, how many years have you been this way? And the man looked at Peter and James with these eyes of like, here, help me. Give me money. Because obviously the man couldn't work. He was poor and, and just lacked. But it's amazing how many of us walk across people like that that are so broken and so destitute and so lost. And, and we, without even knowing, look at them as useless or pointless. You might not say, but you're living it sometimes because they're so far gone. Can we be honest in church? You see the drunk, why, why help them? They're just going to go drink again. Useless. Pointless. Why give them money? They're going to use it for drugs. Useless. Pointless. Vain. The only reason you think that way is because you don't believe in the power. And Peter and James looked at that man and he said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up, rise, and walk. And the man leaped and praised. And guess what? God doesn't want to give you silver and gold. God wants to give you health and healing so that you can have more than enough beyond just a moment of a coin, a dime, a nickel. A little. That's, that's the name that has power. Let's stop talking about all of the giants. And let's be like David who showed up on the scene of, of David and Goliath. And, and instead of talking about how big Goliath was like Israel, David had a different spirit. He showed up, he says, what? Who's this uncircumcised Philistine thinking that he can come up against the armors of God? What's wrong with you? And Israel's like, shh, he's gonna hear you. David said, come on. And he went up head to head and instead of talking about his giant, oh, let me tell you something. Though that giant taunted him, come on, was talking all kinds of smack to him on how he would feed him to the birds. You know what David said? He said, you know what? You come to me with sword and, and javelin and, 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 and shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord, and today you are going down. That's power. If it was good enough for David, why isn't it good enough for us? And he didn't even have Jesus yet. He just knew of a Lord, but he didn't know the Savior yet. You and I have the Savior. How are we going to approach our giant? Can we give the Lord a hand clap for that? If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below. And we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.